Hello, my name is Alexander Goodman and I am the host of the Antiquity in Question podcast. We, like Derek, talk about the ancient world discussing topics from classical Greece, the Hellenistic period, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire and even more archaeological topics such as Egypt. We release an episode once every two weeks on a Friday. There will be links below to our podcast on all major podcasting websites and YouTube. If finding out if Alexander the Great really was great, or if the Punic Wars meant Rome became an empire interesting to you, then do come over and give us a listen. Our next podcast will be on the fall of the Roman Republic, and was it inevitable? Hi there, you're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast, Episode 21, Assuming the Diadem, Kingship in the Hellenistic Age. In the 21st century, the notion of living under a rule of monarchy has become a relic of an old world. We certainly have royal families who exist as a figurehead of their nations, the Windsor family of the United Kingdom, or the Imperial family of Japan come immediately to mind. But the number of states actually dominated by the powers of a royal family or dynasty is actually quite small. This trend has been in development since at least the Enlightenment age of the 18th century, where the ideals of civil rights, political representation, and even thoughts of revolution began to spread like wildfire across the world, and the notions of absolute monarchy were challenged. Many of us living in these nations, much like the founders and thinkers who permeated the rise of the modern state, have been influenced by these notions in our view of the ancient world. It's hard not to imagine readers to feel a natural sympathy and inclination towards the democracy of Athens or the res publica of Republican Rome, as they may feel a kinship through the spirit of political tradition that these nations claim to be inheritors of. In light of history, it may be said that these are the exceptions. Whether under a Basileus, a Shahanshah, Pharaoh, or Emperor, rule under a monarch was the norm. Scholars of old, and some new, have often viewed the Hellenistic Age as a time of political regression. The flames of democracy were snuffed out by the domination of Alexander the Great and the successor kingdoms. The rise of the Hellenistic kingship ushered in a new era of political despotism across the majority of the known world. Now, I have no dog in this fight, and my goal is not to make the case for or against autocracy, but instead, I look to see how the ideas and notions of what it means to be a Hellenistic ruler, emphasizing the similarities and differences between the Ptolemies of Egypt, the Antigonids of Macedon, and the kings of the Seleucid Empire. I chose these three because they provide us with the best evidence, but at the same time, I will make references to other smaller kingships, such as Pergamon, Pontus, and the like, but I will refrain from going into as much detail about them. I will deal with them in their own series. So, join me, as we will cover the Hellenistic kingship. The Hellenistic monarchy didn't exactly originate in a vacuum. Before we begin to look at the specific details about the functions of a Hellenistic king, it's probably best to start at roughly the time of Philip II, around 350 to 340 BC. The Greek world up to this point was not as familiar with a dynastic monarchy. In the Greek political mind, to have a king was rather archaic, a callback to the time of the Homeric tradition of the Late Bronze Age, the so-called Wanax. There were certainly a number of contemporary cities that had kings, such as the Eurypontid and Agiad lines of Sparta, or they had military strongmen who certainly appear like kings. I'm thinking largely of the tyrants of Syracuse, like Agathocles or Dion. But these two examples are not displays of ultimate authority. The Spartan kings function more like a symbolic monarchy, akin to the modern United Kingdom. And the tyrants rarely managed to establish a hereditary dynasty, with the rule passing from father to son, without the son being assassinated or the governments overthrown by angry citizens. To the perception of the Greeks, nothing appeared to separate civilized men from the barbarians more than those living under kingships. The idea of living in a polis, under their rule of law, was considered the ideal state of affairs for a Greek. Nothing embodied this outlook further than the quote-unquote servile natures of the civilians of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, 
and the greatest despot of them all would be the great king, or Shahanshah. The Persian Empire was the largest and most successful state in the known world, and while at the time it was experiencing difficulties in keeping rebellious satrapies in line, the great king retained a level of admiration from the Greeks, marveling at the ability to amass such vast armies and resources under his command. If you listen to my earlier episodes on the Persian Empire or the later campaigns of Alexander the Great, the court rituals and practices of the great king left much to be desired in the eyes of the Greeks and traditional Macedonians. The use of proskinesis, the army of court flatterers, concubines, and whatever exotic tropes that wouldn't appear out of place in the Orientalist paintings of Eugene Delacroix, Alexander experienced some major ideological challenges at attempting to integrate some of these practices with his army and officers. But it will become more clear that the influence of the status of the Shahanshah managed to permeate the later style of the Hellenistic world. But the biggest contributor to Hellenistic kingship undoubtedly was the throne of Macedon, the Basileos. To the Greeks, their northern neighbors were little better than the barbarians, not unlike the Thracians or Epirotes. The kingship was only considered marginally better, since the Argia dynasty claimed to have Greek roots tracing back to Argos, at least that's what Herodotus tells us, but a number of habits, including the taking of several wives, drinking parties lasting all night long, hunting, and the inevitable political assassinations of potential rivals upon the crowning of a new king, all bothered the Greeks. The Basileos' most important role while serving as the head of state was the command of the armies. Legend has it that Aeropus I was placed at the battle line to serve as a figurehead of the troops, while he was just a little infant. The philosopher Aristotle, writing in the 4th century, speaks in his politics about the various forms of kingship, claiming that the Macedonian monarchy probably matches what he calls the heroic kingship. This is exemplified by the fact that the king was akin to a comrade in arms, proving his worth as a ruler through bravery in battle and acts of generosity towards his fellow subjects and men. It wouldn't be far-fetched to say that the king's door was open to anyone should they need him. This last point definitely stands out, when we see the angry reactions of the Macedonian soldiers towards Alexander's gradual distancing into more of an unapproachable figure. Given that Aristotle was Alexander's tutor and spent many years at the court of Pella, he was probably very intimate with the workings of the Macedonian throne, and I think his judgment isn't too far-fetched, if a bit idealistic. At the same time, it is thought that the ruling figure of Macedon was not all-powerful. He had to beckon to the whims of the nobility akin to the feudal politics of the early Middle Ages. It is not until the reign of Philip II, starting at about 359 BC, that we see some serious changes to the structure of the kingship. The heavy-handedness of Macedonian aristocrats was kept to a minimum, as Philip leveraged existing Macedonian systems to tie them closer and improve their loyalty to the throne. The king began to take on a more supreme status, and the final explosive change came in the form of Alexander the Great. I talked at length about the gradual transformation of the notion of a Macedonian kingship into something quasi-imperial, a blend of Greco-Macedonian and Persian traditions to compensate for ruling such a vast land of diverse peoples. To sum it up in a nutshell, it was a mixed response. While Alexander was able to exalt himself into something demigodlike in the eyes of subordinates through victory, spoils of war, and glory, his quote-unquote orientalizing left a sour taste in the mouths of conservative Macedonians. Despite his failures, Alexander would make an enormous imprint on the perception of how a Hellenistic king needs to be, and we will address these influences later throughout the episode. In the period of Alexander's death, we see the emergence of the political orders of the Hellenistic world. The Argia dynasty was all but extinguished, with Alexander's son and half-brother being executed as part of political intrigue, and the marshals who served under Alexander would attempt to carve apart the empire in a series of nearly endless wars, lasting from roughly 320 to 280 BC. These warlords, men like Antigonus Monophthalmos, Seleucus, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, would keep up the illusion that they were still merely officials in the name of the kings of Macedon. In truth, they had already begun to style themselves as their own Basileos in the territories they squatted upon, long before the death of Alexander IV became readily apparent. It was the year 306 when both Antigonus and his son Demetrius Polyarchites soon assumed the diadem, which would be the ultimate visual representation of royal authority, and claimed the title of king. Soon, the other successors followed suit, 
and the complete and total fracturing of the former Macedonian Empire was also complete. The created states that followed, first only a few like Ptolemaic Egypt, the Kingdom of Macedon, the Seleucid Empire of Asia, and the Kingdom of Epirus. But in time, fragmentation would split these lands up further. Pontus, Bithynia, Pergamon, Bactria. It became a free-for-all. And in the 50 years since Alexander's demise, a world that had once only saw a few kings now saw dozens, and the birth of the Hellenistic monarch took place. Now that we have settled the brief outline of the trends leading up to the Hellenistic period, it's time that we begin to talk about the nature of the kingship. What might be an important place to start is to ask, how does one become a Hellenistic monarch? This is a good question, considering that the Hellenistic world was created out of the rise of these self-made kings. One thing that they all shared in common was their role as military figures. In the ancient world, the right to rule was often reinforced with the threat of violence, and to enforce your will required that you carry yourself with enough troops, display your personal skill and bravery, and have an amazing level of ambition towards acquiring a kingdom of your own. It can be said that the original founders of the kingdoms made out of Alexander's empire were all personal monarchs, rather than a national one of the previous generation of kings. What do I mean by this? Well, it became less important about how the monarch represents the will of Macedon, but is instead driven around the identity of the ruler. I am a peasant, and I follow Seleucus not because he is a king of Macedon, but because he is a king unto himself. The need to legitimize yourself as being worthy of being followed required, above all else, victory. In the eyes of the ancients, victory was the functional Greco-Macedonian equivalent to a mandate of heaven. The gods clearly favored you if they deemed you worthy of victory in battle. The prospects of booty and war plunder to pay your soldiers with was also a nice bonus, but clearly there was some sort of divine mischief going on. This ties into the questions of usurpation of political assassinations, because those upstarts who succeeded were never really considered usurpers. They had acquired their position by right. In fact, many of the later monarchs probably could be called usurpers such as Cleopatra VII in the 1st century BC, who murdered at least two brothers and a half-sister to secure herself towards the Egyptian throne, or the success of Seleucid kings of the 170s to the 120s BC. I'm getting a bit sidetracked, but clearly, violence and the use of military muscle allowed for the establishment and legitimacy of dynastic lines. Numerous states, such as the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom of Afghanistan, or most of Anatolia, had started off as military rebellions that managed to hold out on their own, and reinforce their independence and become kingdoms. This wasn't to say that alternative strategies weren't tried. The idea of hereditary succession, the passing of throne from father to son, was certainly an aspect of Macedonian rule. Antigonus I established this tradition right away, with the co-crowning of his son Demetrius at the same time, and Demetrius would officially pass the throne to his son Antigonus Gonatus, and so on and so forth. The other Hellenistic monarchs soon followed suit, such as Seleucus passing the throne to his son Antiochus I, or Ptolemy I Soter to Ptolemy II. But there are always problems. As Dan Carlin excellently put it, hereditary monarchy is a roll of the die. Sometimes you get a talented king like Antiochus III or Alexander the Great. Sometimes you get someone like Philip Aridaeus, who was reputedly epileptic and developmentally disabled. It also need not be said that there are implicit dangers of having lots of children when it comes to inheriting the throne, since the odds that other male members, and some female ones too, can't help but feel slighted at being denied the throne. And many a civil war and assassination were started because of this. Though it must be mentioned that having this many children was a must in the ancient world, given the atrocious infant mortality rates from childhood diseases, so it really was a no-win scenario. In some respects, the candidates for the throne or for establishing a new kingdom required the support of the local population, or at the very least, the elite of the local population. The peoples ruled over by the former generals of Alexander were not strictly Macedonians. Greeks, Persians, Anatolians, Egyptians, Bactrians, Hebrews, all were part of the vast diversity of the territories of the Hellenistic powers, and tended to dwarf the Macedonian populations in these lands. 
The Diodohoi and successor generals in the early Hellenistic period frequently tried to leverage popular support to legitimize their usurpation or establishment of dynasties over foreign peoples. Principally, this was done through military might, but the offering of good services towards the populations, honoring of the local gods, and more were always to curry favor. Demetrius and Antigonus attempted to validate their rule by appealing to the mainland Greeks, earning a reputation as a benefactor, which likely led to their unofficial first crowning in Athens. Seleucus I was a very popular governor of Babylon during his tenure, before fleeing the wrath of Antigonus in 316, and managed to entrench himself and retain local loyalties during the brutal fighting of the Babylonian War in 311-309, and had also ingratiated himself with the Persian elite by being one of the few, if any, officers to stay married to his Persian wife, Apamea, provided by Alexander the Great in the famous Mass Wedding of Susan 324. A military dictatorship can only take you so far. To create something long-lasting necessitated that your population be loyal, or at the very least, complacent. Now that we have established how a king is, well, established, it's time to get to the functions and nitty-gritty details. For the sake of structure and clarity, I'd like to think of the Hellenistic kingship in three parts. The ruler, the image, and the legacy. Let us begin with looking at the ruler, what the king actually did. The king's main duty was governance of the realm, and the realm itself could be rather problematic. With any state that was sufficiently large enough before the development of any form of modern communications technology, Trying to coordinate orders across an empire or a kingdom at the speed of a horse was an issue, to say the least. In some respects, this was always a limiting factor to the extent of a monarch's power, because things like rebellions could never be dealt with in the immediate. The army had to be assembled and led by either the king himself or some from a trusted commander, usually a family member like a son. But the king can't be everywhere, though. So the idea of a supreme ruler in the form of an absolutist monarchy is not feasible in this area. The Basileos had no choice but to instill trusted officials to make sure that his will was put into effect all over parts of the realm. The general term was philoi, or friends. In Alexander's time, the philoi was just a catch-all term for the young nobles who grew up with him and formed aspects of the companion cavalry. But there must have been some sort of evolution from an informal to a formal position, considering that we have terms such as first friends, honored friends, kinsmen, etc. The problem with the idea of the philoi being some widespread bureaucratic system is that the nature of the philoi was played rather fast and loose, because not all philoi were governors or administrators, and not all administrators or governors were philoi. Some of the philoi could have started out as royal pages, serving the king or prince in maintaining his equipment, providing him food on the campaign, or guarding his tent or bedchamber, and thereby proving their loyalty. These pages probably were more favored for more important positions of state, such as serving as governors of the provinces, or perhaps even taking up advisory positions in the royal council. Many arguments claim that the status of Philoi was selected exclusively by the king, distributing them with titles, gifts, and estates, based largely on the idealistic passage of Plutarch, when referring to a story of the Antigonid king Antigonus Gonatas. Quote, when a young man, the son of a brave father, but not himself having any reputation for being a good soldier, suggested that it would be right for him to be given the same gifts his father received. Antigonus, the king, said, quote, My boy, I give rewards for the excellence of a man, not for the excellence of his father. End quote. However, evidence suggests that this is just an ideal, when in reality the philoi could often be inherited through family succession. This could be dangerous, since the philoi would often engage in backroom politics behind the backs of their benefactors. It was also argued that the philoi were almost exclusively of Greco-Macedonian ethnicity, but scholars point out that the presence of Egyptian, Persian, or other members in the philoi or royal court could be obscured by the use of Greek names to hide their identities. If we look at the general administrative outline of the Hellenistic world, a few patterns emerge. The kings had ultimately two categories of urban control, pre-existing and planned cities. Alexander and his successors took control of a region that had a tradition of urbanization stretching back thousands of years. They also had their own traditions when it came to self-governance too, 
And little wonder it was that the Hellenistic kings often tread lightly around these pre-established cities of Asia Minor and the Near East. It cost a lot of time and money to try and apply the screws to a city to force them to be completely submitted. And for many kings, it just wasn't worth the effort. Instead, the kings opted to allow the cities to retain a modicum of independence and self-autonomy, often proclaiming something akin to Antigonus's and Demetrius's championing of the freedom of the Greek cities. These polities would often give tribute and nominal submission to the monarch, but they knew that their loyalty could be bargained for. In Anatolia especially, the Ptolemies and Seleucids frequently tried to outcourt one another with these cities through gifts and money to sway them to their side. Of course, if a city did entirely overthrow the yoke, then it would be treated with little mercy, much like Antiochus IV Epiphanes attempted reconquest of Jerusalem in the 160s. It's not surprising that they had to resort to this policy, because their political predecessors, the Achaemenid Persian Empire, had to form a similar set of rules in order to maintain the semblance of order across such vast swaths of land, whatever flaws the satrapy system may have had. The other category, planned cities, is another story. Indeed, part of the attempts at propaganda was to follow the suit of Alexander in the foundation of cities. Alexander had founded somewhere along the lines of 70 cities bearing his name, the most famous one being Alexandria in Egypt. It became something of a tradition among kings to build cities bearing their own or their family name. Antioch or Seleucia on the Tigris by Seleucus I, Cassandrea by Cassander, Lysimachia by Lysimachus. Given that there was no pre-existing tradition of governance in these cities, the Hellenistic kings eventually came up with a rather innovative solution. The use of epistates, sanctioned officials who were the effective governors of the region. Polybius goes into some detail about the placement of these epistates, mentioning how they usually were the king's phalloi, and would act as the arbiter between the wishes of the city and the populace and the wishes of the king. These were successful, given that we have very few instances of them rebelling in a main capital. The governance system wasn't all hunky-dory, though since many times a prominent phalloi who remained governor of a region for several years could suddenly reveal his more ambitious side and declare independence, thanks to the loyalties he had engendered with his services with the local population and the city. One example is Diodotus, who was the governor of Bactria for almost 20 years under Seleucid rule, before raising rebellion and became the founding member of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. But Ptolemaic Egypt was more heavy-handed than the Seleucids, as Ptolemy I instituted a system of clerks to extract as much capital out of the populace. The kingdom was fabulously wealthy, but the ever-increasing burden of taxation led to hostility between the native Egyptians and the Macedonian ruling class, inciting a massive rebellion in southern Egypt in roughly 206, which lasted down to the 180s. Moving from the macro scale to the micro, let us look at the day-to-day -day structure of the king. The focal point of the kingly operations was the palace. It was a home for the royal family, where the kings entertained guests and engaged in matters with the bureaucracy. The palace was never particularly consistent in design, given that kings usually liked to constantly expand and engage in some home improvement over the palaces of their predecessors, and the Seleucids liked to have a series of palaces, mainly because of the sprawling size of their empire. We best know about the Palace of Alexandria in Egypt thanks mostly to ancient authors who marveled at the splendor of it, because currently it's now underwater. The design of palaces was never the same, considering the many influences you had. The famous honeypots of the ancient Near East, pharaonic palaces of Egypt, the traditions of Macedon and the tyrants, the kings could pick and choose at their leisure. In the palace, a session of the royal council would commonly take place. As I mentioned earlier, this tended to be comprised of advisors, philoi, and the favorites of the monarchs, who would come together in order to discuss matters of state. Polybius gives us a picture of the court of Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire, showing us the structured nature of a session. A case or issue would be brought up, then a hierarchy of speakers, ranging from the most to the least senior, would speak their thoughts in order. And lastly, the king would provide the closing statement and ultimately a decision. These courts were remarkably influential, and while it was an effective way to garner advice and ideas, the court could easily dominate a weak-willed ruler. Besides the court, the king would have his entourage stationed with him. These could range from court flatterers and sycophants 
intellectuals and artists, and prominently, political exiles. The Seleucids are a particularly good example of that last point, since their courts are populated with disgrace or would-be leaders like Ptolemy Carinus, Demetrius Polyarchetes, and even the Carthaginian general Hannibal Barca after the Second Punic War. To get into the more raunchy aspects, many of these courts could have the royal wife or wives, depending on the ruler in question, and often concubines. I do love the raunchy stories of the love-struck king wrapped around the finger of a wily consort. But the concubines could easily be influential figures, if acting as go-betweens for lower-ranking officials than the king. The king, while as figurehead of the state, would also be involved with the affairs of the general public. It was extremely important to take care of your citizens, whether rich or poor, because the threat of rebellion was always a distinct possibility, especially since the majority of the population was not ethnically Greek or Macedonian. Petitions, legal disputes, appeals, and more were all listened to by the king, which could be an onerous process if they were traveling up and down the realm. Still, the king had to play nice with the nobility and peoples of the land, lest they get any funny ideas. Though the kings would often be bogged down by civil disputes, there were also matters of diplomacy between the other kings and kingdoms. The most common form of diplomacy between the kings, besides going to war, which I guess isn't really diplomacy, was marriage. I kind of cringe with dread with the future prospects of having to make family trees of the Hellenistic royal dynasties, because one of the things that is striking about it all is just how closely related all of the families were. I'm not talking about incest, though various degrees of it do stand out, uh, Ptolemies. <coughs> In general, the social and political prestige of a potential bachelor or bachelorette required betrothal or marriage to someone who was of a near equal rank. Princesses tended to marry princes or kings, and the size of families restricted how many daughters and sons can be passed around in diplomatic sessions. The kings used these marriages not necessarily for grand alliances, but as insurance for agreements to not attack one another in the immediate present. For instance, Seleucus's marriage to Demetrius's daughter Stratonike was not of a military alliance, whereby Demetrius would attack Seleucus's enemies and vice versa, because Seleucus and Ptolemy continued to wage war without Demetrius's intervention. It was a formal agreement and oftentimes the individual spouses in these relationships could be summoned back on a whim from their father or brother. But we also have a good number of cases of these daughters and sisters returning back home of their own volition and will. Besides these marriages, Hellenistic kings were relatively practical and pragmatic. While a peace treaty was signed between two kings, it often only extended to the lifetime of those involved. There are nine Syrian wars between the Seleucids and Ptolemies, and although a number of treaties were signed, they were almost immediately broken once one of these kings had died. When war was finally declared, it was a primary job of a king to act as commander, strategos. Warfare was the ultimate driver of the ancient economy, whether through the booty and plunder acquired, captives taken and sold into the slave market, or the passing of money from the hands of the soldiers through the local markets they happened to pass through. This, in conjunction with the necessity of victory to prove one's worth, meant that new kings often had to start out with a military campaign in order to get credentials. A favorite way for some of the Anatolian kingdoms, like Pergamon, to prove their military distinction was to go beat up some Galatians and claim you fought against monstrous barbarians. The core of the Hellenistic military remained largely the same for most of the period as it did in Philip and Alexander's time utilizing the bristling walls of the Macedonian phalanx as an anvil, and delivering a decisive cavalry charge as the hammer. It was a very successful tactic, but was rarely innovated on. It could be a combination of where do we go from here, or it may be the fact that they needed to harken back to this golden ideal of Alexander. The kings typically would take their place at the right wing of the cavalry and ride out into battle. None of them, however, had the luck of Alexander and many kings were killed in battle because they threw themselves in the thick of it, some ingloriously like Pyrrhus, who was killed by a roof tile thrown in his head and stabbed while he was on the ground. Some later unit varieties would be incorporated, elephants and scythe chariots, for instance, largely for the prestige factor to bolster the king's image rather than actually being effective, but there were later developments that would try to readjust the system, but much of it was for naught. <laughs> 
Perhaps one of the more interesting trends of the Hellenistic monarch is the development of a certain untouchable status. Men, unlike the Macedonian kings of Philip II and before, the Basileos was more exclusive, less approachable. Perhaps their greatest influence, at least in the early stages of the Hellenistic age, was the imitation of Alexander the Great. In many ways, the kings, especially the immediate successors and Diodohoi of Alexander, had often harkened back to certain tropes and images that emerged during the Great King's period. The long flowing hair, the eternal youthful look, that twist of the neck to appear to glance towards the heavens, the use of the diadem. These can all be easily seen in the coinage and busts of the Hellenistic kingdoms, from Pontus to Bactria. It's almost comical, because many of the Diodohoi had attempted to cut the Alexandrian look, even while in their old age when they were rather fat and probably missing quite a number of teeth. The kings also doubled down on the trusted tools of Alexander, the Macedonian phalanx, and leading the cavalry in decisive charge, war elephants, and so on and so forth. In a revealing comment by the moralist Plutarch in his Life of Demetrius, he speaks about the image the Diodohoi attempted to present themselves with as they assumed the kingship. Quote, now, this practice, meaning the use of the diadem, did not mean the addition of a name or a change of fashion merely, but it stirred the spirits of the men, lifted their thoughts high, and introduced into their lives and dealings with others pomposity and ostentation, just as tragic actors adapt to their costumes their gait, voice, posture at table, and manner of addressing others. Consequently, they became harsher in their judicial decisions also. They laid aside that dissemblance of power which formerly had often made them more lenient and gentle with their subjects. So great an influence had a flatterer single word, and with it, so great a change did it fill the whole world. End quote. Plutarch, and probably many of the Macedonians who served under these men, weren't particularly impressed by this aping of a legendary figure like Alexander. Later in the life of Demetrius, when comparing Demetrius to Pyrrhus of Epirus, he makes the comment, quote, And many declared that Pyrrhus was the only king in whom they could see an image of the great Alexander's courage. The others, and especially Demetrius, only imitated Alexander in the pomp and outward show of majesty, like actors on a stage. End quote. Many also used the ties, whether through blood or even quasi-spiritual to Alexander and the Argead household, as a way to originally bolster their positions among the Macedonian army and population. The most obvious example could be the possession of artifacts of Alexander. His signet ring, his armor, his family, and even his corpse, which was stolen by Ptolemy and later used as sort of a talisman to give a sense of legitimacy and prestige. One interesting development is the continuation of the notion of a semi-divine ruler. One of the great controversies of Alexander's time was the nature of his mortality and godhood, and this was sort of addressed in the Hellenistic period. Understand, though, that this does not mean that the population believed that their kings were deities on earth, walking around. The Greek and Macedonians always tended to have a more ambiguous attitude towards the division between man and god, it was believed, and certainly so by Alexander himself, that through the acts of great deeds, they could exalt a mortal to the realm of the gods after their death. Heracles, Achilles, Dionysus, all were mythological examples that could be pointed out to, and Alexander himself was clearly the most recent case, at least according to the Greeks and Macedonians. Many of the founding dynasts had attempted to add some sort of divine parentage or ancestry to help legitimize their rule, much in the same fashion of the legends of surrounding Alexander's conception and his descendants from Zeus and other great heroes. Seleucus has an elaborate backstory involving the union between his mother and Apollo, and Pyrrhus played up his ancestry to Achilles and Heracles. Perhaps the most powerful and fascinating manifestation of the divine ruler was the creation of the so-called kingship cult, which took on various forms. The basic idea is that the Hellenistic king is mortal, but wields a level of divine power, specifically the ability to protect the people. In return for this protection, the populace would offer what they what's called isotheoi timai, honors equal to those bestowed on the gods. This implicitly suggests that the kings themselves were not divine, but were given the same offerings as one if they were, 
This could appear in the form of epithets and titles, such as soter, or small festivals whereby the statue of the ruler would be garnered with flowers or garlands. The benefit to the cities and citizens who celebrated it, at least on paper, is that it was often a move that would force the king to behave in a more proper manner in a godly way, i.e. to not be a huge jerk and give them protection when they needed it. It was officially pr promoted by the ruler, but we have indications that private worship took place, since altars of the cult of Arsinoe had been found in private houses far from Egypt in Miletus. It was a unique way to unite the various peoples, who would provide worship and offers in their own custom to the rulers and thus feel a sense of connection. With Ptolemaic Egypt's heavy taxation burdens, it's little wonder they so aggressively marketed the cult onto the population. Besides pushing their own cult image, the rulers would also attempt to paint themselves as pious kings. Festivals for the traditional Greek pantheon were expected, but it quickly became clear that paying respects to the gods of the local peoples who you ruled over was probably not a bad idea. Many of these regions had long been under the yoke of foreign rule, and thus the populations tended to stick close towards their native priests and religions as a form of cultural unity. Whether acting to secure a form of divine insurance or as a political move, Alexander had managed to gain the loyalty of many peoples by offering his respects to local pantheons, most famously at the Temple of Ammon and the Oracle of Siwa. He also ordered the reconstruction of the temples of Babylonian gods and goddesses to win over support, and this became a tactic that would be repeated by the later Hellenistic kings. Paying the local priesthoods in the form of bribes, I mean religious offerings, was a good way to keep order and garner loyalties from the native populace. They also attempted to push unique religious cults, for instance the cult of Serapis, pushed by the Ptolemies, as a way to further unite the peoples that they ruled over with a Greco-Macedonian ideal. The way the Basileos best marketed himself to the citizens across the empire would be through the use of coinage. The story in the book of Matthew in the Bible refers to Jesus Christ's use of a Roman denarius as the quickest representation of the emperor, and it would be essentially the same if it were the portrait of Alexander rather than of Tiberius Caesar. Coins were passed through the hands daily, being seen by everyone across the realm and beyond. They usually had the portrait of the king, cutting a rather impressive image a la the Alexandrian ideal I mentioned earlier, and often had some sort of eponymous title or imagery associated with them. Gods, weapons, depictions of battle, all were used to communicate the meaning of the ruler. I'm the boss, render unto me what is mine. Many of the rulers also styled themselves as Philhellene benefactors. The gifting of theaters, baths, libraries, acting as patrons for the arts, was one of the ways Greek culture spread throughout the Hellenistic world. The famous Library of Alexandria and Pergamon were directly created on the order of the Hellenistic kings to act as suppositories of knowledge, and thereby also establishing a sort of standard Greek education through the copying of plays, philosophical works, and poetry deemed worthy of study. Intellectual life was fostered in many of the king's cities as a way to boost the prestige and educate their children not to mention the ability to show off the marvelous technology they were able to have produced by the scientists and mathematicians that, that resided in their lands. Commissions of geographers, explorers, and diplomats allow them to also better understand the landscape and geography of their realm and the peoples of those beyond. When the Romans decisively defeated Philip V of Macedon at Kynoscephalae in 197 BC, it marked a turning point in the nature of the Hellenistic kingship. At least when it came to the Eastern Mediterranean, Hellenistic kings were no longer the heavyweights that they once were. The Romans, in their distaste for anything vaguely kinglike, would view the rulers as oriental tyrants, much in the same way the Greeks had once viewed the Persians. The meaning of the ruler mattered little to the brutal diplomacy of the Roman Republic, and many of them fell under Rome's sway or were pushed around until they did so. The Roman consul Gaius Papilius Linus, in a diplomatic meeting with Antiochus IV in 169 BC, ordered Antiochus to cease his invasion of Egypt, and when the king protested, Linus drew a circle in the dust around Antiochus's feet claiming that the king better give a satisfactory answer to give to Rome. 
Livy paints a rather pathetic picture as Antiochus stepped out of the circle, and like an ashamed puppy he spoke, I shall do as the Senate decrees. The Romans believed themselves to be the ultimate decision maker when it came to matters involving the king, taking in the ruler as a client or a friend and ally of the people of Rome. The stereotypes never ceased throughout the last stages of the Hellenistic age, before one by one each kingdom was absorbed by Rome or the Parthians in the east. While we still have a long ways to go when it comes to the end of the Hellenistic age, the legacy of the kings remained ever-present in the former territories they occupied. Perhaps the most obvious example is in the influence on the Roman emperor, ironic considering the republic's disgust for the Hellenistic kings. Later in Augustus's reign, a temple dedicated to the divine Augustus would be built in some of the eastern provinces, almost in an exact manner of his Hellenistic predecessor's divine cults. It is doubtful that the Roman Empire would have had as much success in its eastern territories without the precedent of the Hellenistic Basileus that had come before. When the Romans took control of these eastern territories, they inherited many of the similar administrative institutions that were built up by the Hellenistic monarchs. Koine Greek remained the administrative language of the eastern territories, eventually supplanting Latin and the regions of the later Byzantine Empire would continue to use Greek as the dominant language throughout the Middle Ages. The cities the kings founded would often last throughout the Roman period as important economic and political centers for the empire. Above all else, Alexandria and Antioch, which would play prominent roles until the invasion of the Rashidun Caliphate in the 7th century AD. Ironically, the Romans would themselves be the greatest legacy of the Hellenistic monarchy, as they themselves were Hellenized after the conquests. I believe I have said enough about the Hellenistic kingship. If you want to learn more about them, I highly recommend Kings and Kingship in the Hellenistic World by John D. Granger, which I have relied extensively upon while researching in this episode. While some of you may wonder why I have neglected to mention much about Hellenistic queens, I must say that I definitely plan to cover the role of Hellenistic queens in their own episode series as part of a larger look at the role of Hellenistic women. And partially it's because we have so much more information about the kings, given their political clout and presence in warfare, thus making them prime targets for being recorded in history. But don't worry, I will get to them soon. In the meantime, thank you all for listening and supporting the podcast. It does mean a lot to me to see your feedback. If you liked what you've listened to and want to hear more, please consider subscribing to me on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Also, please leave a 5-star review if you're on iTunes. Every little bit helps the show grow and expand. If you want to keep updated on the show's production, hear little historical facts and see photo blurbs, or just want to send me a message, follow me on Twitter at Twitter handle HellenisticPOD. That's all one word. Show notes for the episode are listed on my podcast website, where you'll find a list of sources used, images, and useful guides to help you understand the material better. All of these links will be provided in the show notes and podcast description where I have also included a link to the Antiquity in Question podcast. They've just started out and doing a great job so far. Give them a listen and help them grow. The next time we meet, it will be for a two-part look at the early Roman Republic. So, until then, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age podcast. <laughs>